Hi Gapsters, how are you Gapsters doing? Welcome back to another one of my PhD series. This is number two. Yes, 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 yes. We're getting there, we're getting there Gapsters. Um, thank you so much for joining me again and hopefully you guys are finding this helpful. Let me know what else you'd like, what other information you'd like to find out about um, applying for PhDs as well as getting a supervisor or any other topic that you'd like to discuss. As you can see by the title of the topic today, today we're discussing um, how to choose a school, applying to a school, as well as how to choose a school. I'm going to start with um, how to apply to a school for your PhD, and I'm going to start with a school that the school that you did your undergraduate in, as well as your postgraduate study. So if you're applying to the same university that you did your postgraduate studies in then it's slightly different to when you're applying to a school that um, you haven't attended before. So if you're applying to a school that you attended that you attended for your previous postgraduate degree, it's a lot easier because they don't require that much um, paperwork from you as well as um, some of the requirements sort of fall away because you've already attended the school and are already a student in the school. So, for instance, where I go to school, because I was applying to the same department that I was in already, and because I was using the same supervisor that was that I was that was that had already supervised me, I didn't require to write a proposal. I just went to and spoke to her and I said, "Look, I'm thinking of doing my PhD. Would you be okay supervising me?" And she was like, "Okay." So I just did the online application and I was accepted because I'd already spoken to the department and they had agreed to the fact that you know I had reached all the requirements that were needed. And the bureaucracy is just a lot easier versus when you're applying to a school where maybe you've never been a student before. So if you're applying to a school where you haven't been a student before, um, before you even can do the application to get accepted into the school, you have to get a supervisor. In order to do that, um, people choose supervisors in different ways, and I'll discuss that next. So you pick a supervisor and you send out um, a proposal of what you propose to do for your PhD studies, and you email it to various supervisors across the world. And hopefully one of them is going to say, yes, I love your project and I would love to supervise you. Once you have the yes, you are good. You can come be one of my students. Then you apply to the university with the confirmation from that person saying that they will supervise you, right? So you need to have a supervisor before you can even apply to the university is the general rule. So, and that doesn't apply for when you are applying at the same school and the same university and the same department that you were in previously. Um, I just had to write a small paragraph on the online application saying this is my proposed topic and, um, and that was good enough. I didn't have to write a full on proposal. However, you do need a proposal if you're going to be applying for funding and those kind of things, but I'll discuss that in a different video. How do video. you decide on which supervisors you're going to send your proposal to? Because in as much as you want to go to certain schools, the most important relationship in your PhD is the relationship you have with your supervisor. That's more important really sometimes than the university that you go to. I mean, many people choose universities depending on their um, ratings in the world, as well as how good they are in the field that you are studying in, as well as um, how accessible it is to them, and many other things influence that, right? You want a highly reputable university that you can get to and from quite easily with, with the recognition of being a leader in the studies that you are trying to do, right? But, and, and you pick and choose, right? You can't, sometimes you can't have it all, so you choose some things over and above other things, depending on what your personal preference is. So choosing is. a supervisor. I chose a supervisor that had supervised me already for my um, honors as well as my masters. And I knew her, and we have a really good working relationship. She understands my working style, I understand her working style, and it works really well. I also have two additional supervisors that I work with um, this is a new relationship for me and I've only just um, gotten the supervisors together so I'll have to let you know 
later on when I've had a little bit more experience with them as to how it works, how we're managing it and all of that stuff. So in total, I have three supervisors. This gives a map and I will let you know about how that relationship is going because it is a relationship that you have to manage. The supervisor and supervisee relationship is a minefield because PhDs are minefields. So choosing a supervisor. Firstly, and as choose I a said supervisor, earlier, um, dependent on the school that you want to go to and who they have within the school or the department that you want to be in. And hopefully, if the university, for instance, is priority to you, then you hope that within the university there is a supervisor that has an interest in what it is that you're trying to study or um, makes your attendance at that university worthwhile. So it's a lot more complicated than just having a teacher lecture conversa um, relationship because you have to be able to speak to your supervisor about basically anything. I mean, when things happen in your life, your supervisor is usually one of the first people to know if because if it has any impact on your PhD, then your supervisor, you probably, I mean, honestly, if you're getting married, you probably pick up the phone like, yo, my boyfriend asked me to get married. And then you're like, okay, what's the impact on your PhD, right? I'm, I'm serious. Like, you know, like, you're know, having a baby. Your supervisor's like, you haven't even told your mama yet. And you pick it up, hey, mommy, hey, hey, soup. I have a baby. You know, the, I mean, those, that's how, that is how um, close you guys become. Whether you are close, emotionally close, or whether you are close sort of because you have to, your supervisor ends up knowing your business. And if they don't know your business, then it's a problem. So as I was saying, the relationship between you and your supervisor is something that you also have to set the boundaries for and decide what kind of relationship that you want. I'm very lucky. I have a supervisor that I've been working with for a couple of years, so our relationship has been able to grow. Other people prefer a more objective sort of, you know, like clear-cut student and supervisor and their role is like, you know, sort of like ooh, different lanes versus intersections and, um, you know, people thrive on that. Supervisors also have different ways in which they supervise you. Like my supervisor has a very much, this is your degree, therefore you determine how fast or how slow it goes. Um, you know, she can only push me as far as I want to be pushed. This is other supervisors who insist on, you know, meeting a certain number of times in a month and, you know, having a lot more formal and structured supervision um, structure. And that really is how that happens and how you guys frame it really should be a conversation between the two of you. It shouldn't be a top-down approach because if you are being put in a formal structure and that's not how you function best, you will start just rebelling against it instead of doing your PhD or if you need a lot more structure and you have a supervisor who believes that you need to be self-motivated then you need to be like look I need some structure in my life because you know if you need if you need structure and you're not getting it then you probably crumble and just like oh, I don't know where I am sometimes I need structure sometimes I need you know just to be let let go just let go or you okay. can um, choose a supervisor who is well known and reputable in the field and therefore you would potentially go to a university based on the supervisor and not necessarily based on the reputation of the university. And um, in this instance, people are trying to access different things from that, right? If the supervisor is reputable, if they have a long history in the field, or if they are seen to be up and coming, sort of the next generation of whatever it is that they're trying to study, you get different things out of that relationship, right? For instance, if, a supervi if the supervisor has been um, long established in the field, you're probably getting a history of knowledge and um, you're getting a very historical perspective of um, whatever field you're trying to study. So you you can tap into that knowledge that has been built up over the years from your supervisor versus if you are um, choosing a supervisor who is up and coming and relatively new in the field but is doing groundbreaking work, you could be um, on a fast train but not knowing exactly where to hold on, you know, because if they are like, you know, zooming past, you know, fast tracked 
you know, sort of just like, oh yes, this person is the new next big thing, right? You can get on that train and you can be part of the changes that are happening within that field. But with that also comes different pros and cons. For instance, a highly established, long-standing supervisor within a field probably has more contacts, probably has um, a lot more, a wider range of knowledge and understanding of what it is that you're trying to do, um, you know, so they can access, maybe do a lot more interdisciplinary stuff. Or the cons could be that maybe they're so stuck in whatever it is that they have been doing all along that they're not able to be visionaries in terms of what it is that you're trying to achieve and in terms of sticking with the times versus an up-and-coming, newer, younger, um, less established, but definitely more sort of a visionary. Um, supervisor, they could be, um, they might not necessarily have well established themselves within the field or they might have lesser contacts in those kind of ways but their work could be so groundbreaking that you don't need to be tapping into old as old established contacts or you know tapping into sort of that that new groundbreaking stuff could be just enough to propel your career into you know, what it is you that you needed to be. You could a supervisor according to the amounts of funding that they have. Some supervisors are really good at getting funding and therefore your PhD process could be like, hey, hey, you know, hey, let it rain. Uh, this is my PhD process where I'm like, oh my God, look at how much things cost, right? So depending on the funding that the supervisor has and access to funding that they have, I mean, let's be honest, money does change the way in which you experience things, right? And let me tell you, having to penny pinch throughout your studies is not nice. It's not nice at all, you know. I mean, it could literally mean the difference between you having to work during your PhD or not having to work during your PhD. Um, how much time you can spend in the field, right? Um, what kind of tools you can use um, to collect your data. Um, for instance, I'm doing vlogging. I am very limited in the kind of tools that I have. You know, I have to think about every single thing that I buy. I have to think about, oh, I need a tripod. What kind of tripod am I going to buy? Do I buy one that's really good for longevity or do I buy one that's cheap that I can afford for now and hopefully be able to buy a better tripod later on? Um, funding is really, really, really important in terms of um, what data you collect, how you collect that data, when you collect that data, and for how long you collect that data for. Um, it can really change the amount of time. As an anthropologist, it's really important for me to spend as much time Other things in the that field. come into consideration when you're considering um, a supervisor is where they are doing research. Um, if your supervisor is doing research in an area that, um, and I mean a physical space, if your supervisor is doing, or your potential supervisor is doing space in a space where you would like to be, for maybe personal reasons, maybe you'd like to stay closer to home and therefore looking for a research field that is closer to home, maybe then you choose a supervisor according to that versus going to um, going with a supervisor or a school where research would be required of you to do it really far away and you wouldn't be able to if be close you to want family. to travel. Maybe you're going to choose a supervisor in a different country so that you can be able to travel and live elsewhere and, you know, experience different things. It's up to you because your PhD experience is basically whatever it is that you want. Thank you guys for sticking around and being part of this video. I'm sorry if the lighting keeps on going on and off, but I, I'm using natural light today and there's clouds and the sun comes out and goes in and comes out and goes in. But otherwise, bye Gabsters.